You and your crew have been eagerly awaiting the deployment to Europe for several weeks. But at last, the planning is done. Your bags are packed. The only thing left to do is pre-flight your buff for an easy 10-hour sortie to England. After that, it's two weeks of fairly short, pre-canned sorties. You'll probably find lots of time for sightseeing. Things look great so far and seem to be getting better. Nothing could possibly go wrong. Your buff is in the green and ready to roll. You'll be in cell with a KC-135 for the flight to England. The tanker will haul your crew chief and maintenance. Pre-flight goes smoothly and it's time to taxi. There's just enough time for one last mental check as you roll toward the runway. With a familiar roar, your long journey begins. Take off and climb out, proceed nicely, until you hear the tanker abort. Three hours later, you're over the ocean, but your tanker is still sitting at home base. Fuel isn't a problem, though, so you'll press on and let them catch up in England. Ten hours later, you arrive in the old country. Time to rest, at least you thought it was. Unfortunately, the tanker never made it off, and a replacement is 48 hours away but you've got to fly tomorrow night. It looks like the crew gets to turn the buff. No problem, right? It's only been a year since you attended the servicing class and you only dozed a little. Still, it'd be nice to have some refresher training. You'll find a complete servicing diagram in section one of your flight manual. This diagram shows all the various filler ports and lists fluid specifications and their NATO equivalents. Section 2 contains checklists which outline your strange field procedures. With the whole crew pitching in, such tasks as installing wheel chocks, landing gear down locks and bypass keys, duct plugs, and pitot tube covers can be knocked out in no time at all. The configuration of the bomb bay doors is dependent on the type of weapons loaded, if any. While the flight manual lists the tasks required to turn the aircraft, the detailed procedures you'll use to accomplish them are found in the maintenance job guides. These job guides are carried aboard each aircraft. First, we'll review the tasks that must be performed prior to another flight. These include fuel servicing, engine oil servicing, and hydraulic system servicing. Then we'll look at some tasks that may need to be done in certain situations. These include starter cartridge installation, EVS window wash tank filling, and drag chute door closing. Let's start our review with fuel servicing. We'll cover both types, single point refueling and over the wing refueling. Four people are needed to accomplish single point refueling. This crew will consist of a refueling supervisor, a fire guard who will operate and monitor the power unit, a fuel panel operator, and an operator for the pit cart or fuel truck. If you are using a fuel truck, the driver will do this job. Now let's review some safety considerations. Warning, at sea level pressure and temperatures between minus 10 degrees and 80 degrees Fahrenheit, JP4 fuel vapors within a container are normally explosive. Vapors may be ignited by any object with a surface temperature above 540 degrees Fahrenheit. Filament temperatures in electric light bulbs or flashlight bulbs are far above this temperature. Smoking materials and spark producing jewelry will not be taken into the servicing area. Clothing worn in the servicing area should be of non-static producing materials. Shoes must not contain metal clips or nails. Before and frequently during the entire fueling operation, each crew member will dissipate body static by grasping the bare or exposed part of the static ground wire. 
The aircraft should be positioned at least 50 feet from buildings or other aircraft and no maintenance shall be accomplished on the aircraft. Servicing personnel should avoid excessive breathing of vapors and excessive skin contact with fuel. If you are fortunate enough to have a Halon fire extinguisher, only one is required, halfway between the power unit and the fuel truck or pit cart. Otherwise, you must have two extinguishers, one at each location. To start the job, you must first determine how the fuel will be distributed. The aircraft weight and balance data will help you in this determination. Now it's time to ground the aircraft. Ensure you have two grounding wires available. Check their clip jaws to ensure they are not deformed, their set screws are tight, and the springs are not weak. The bayonet plugs should be free of corrosion and have tight lock nuts. Check the ground wires for broken strands. A wire should be replaced if more than one third of the strands are broken. Attach the ground wires to the earth ground first. Then plug them into the aircraft grounds. Check the aircraft receptacles to make sure they are securely mounted. Now that we have the aircraft grounded, we need to post the refueling area with cones. Cordon off a 50-foot area around the single-point refueling receptacle and the pit cart, and a 25-foot area around the wing and body tank fuel vents. Or you could position cones 25 feet from each wing tip and the nose and tail. Now would be a good time to ensure the AN ALE 20 flare door is open with the streamer attached. Also, clean the landing gear shock struts with a lint free rag and some hydraulic fluid. Ensure the power cart is placed upwind and at least 50 feet from the aircraft. Next, remove the left forward steering bypass key to allow hydraulic pressure to reach the brakes. Once the fuel truck or pit cart is positioned, it needs to be grounded. You need to inspect the grounding wires as you did when you grounded the aircraft. The wire with the clamp is connected to the same earth ground as the aircraft. The wire with the bayonet plug is attached to the aircraft. The receptacle in the crew entry hatch is usually the closest. You are almost ready to begin operations. But first, the refueling supervisor must clear the area of anyone not involved in refueling and verify only JP4 or an equivalent fuel is used. Once the fuel hose is stretched out, it needs to be checked for defects and serviceability. Now remove the single point receptacle cover from the aircraft. Connect the hose nozzle to the receptacle. Rotate the valve handle to open. Ensure the nozzle cannot be rotated and disconnected. Rotate the valve handle to closed. At this point, you should connect the external power cable to the aircraft and start the power unit. Warning: In the event of an emergency, such as a fuel spill, the ground power unit will immediately be shut down using the emergency shutdown procedures. If you're using a Dash 86 Hobart power unit, open the access doors located toward the front of the unit and lift up on the red emergency stop lever. If you're using a Dash 60 power unit, place the master switch to off. If the unit continues to run, close the emergency fuel shutoff valve that is located below the fuel pump and place the remaining switches to off. With either unit, disconnect the power cable after it stops running. Now let's continue with refueling. Apply external power to the aircraft. Then connect the interphone. At no time during refueling will it be disconnected due to the possibility of generating a spark. The refueling supervisor can connect to the interphone panel in the forward wheel well or use the instructor navigator's cord. 
Once the brakes are set, you'll need to reposition the chocks about two inches from the main landing gear tires to allow for expansion during refueling. Before pressurizing the refueling hose, be sure to accomplish the following steps. All crew members should ground themselves. Ensure the main refuel valve emergency control lever in the defense department is centered. And ensure the pilot's and co-pilot's sliding windows are closed. The windows must remain closed until the cabin manifold has been pressurized and checked for leaks. Now pressurize the refueling hose. Ensure the pressure is limited to 55 pounds per square inch. Slowly rotate the valve handle on the refueling nozzle to the open position. Allow the cabin manifold to pressurize for at least two minutes with normal refuel pressure. If the flow meter doesn't indicate any flow after two minutes, and the air refuel slipway drain line does not indicate any leakage, you are clear to refuel the aircraft. Close the valve on the refueling nozzle. Position the refuel valve switch in the cockpit to open. Slowly open the nozzle valve and pressurize the main manifold for at least two minutes. The refuel flow meter should not indicate more than 0.4 gallons per minute flow. After the main manifold is pressurized, position the master refuel switch to on. After fuel servicing is complete, close the nozzle valve handle. Then depressurize the refuel hose. Remove the SPR nozzle from the receptacle after the fuel panel operator evacuates the hose. And reinstall the receptacle cover. Once the hose is reeled in, disconnect the ground wire from the fuel truck to the aircraft, then from the fuel truck to the earth ground. In the cockpit, you'll need to scavenge the cabin manifold. Warning, if automatic shutoff does not occur, as evidenced by the light going out, after 20 minutes, you must terminate scavenging. After scavenging, record each fuel tank quantity, the totalizer reading and the refueling flow meter reading on the AFTO Form 6. Make an entry in the AFTO Form 781A if a body or external tank is empty. Reposition the chocks against the main landing gear. Reinstall the left forward steering bypass key. Release the parking brakes and disconnect the interphone. Remove external power, disconnect the cable, and reposition the power card if it is no longer needed. Finally, reposition the fire bottle to within 25 feet of either wingtip. As you can see, single point refueling is a fairly easy procedure. But if you find yourself limited to a fuel truck without a single point attachment, or worse yet, to 55 gallon drums, then you're limited to filling the tanks individually. Over-the-wing refueling can be accomplished by two people, a fuel truck operator and the servicing crew member. You need a stand or ladder and a wide blade screwdriver. All the safety procedures that apply to single point refueling are still in effect here. Once again, we will double ground the aircraft from the forward and aft wheel wells to one or two identified ramp grounds. The fuel truck is positioned and grounded to the same ramp ground as the aircraft and then to the aircraft. You'll probably need only to apply external power to set the brakes. Reposition the chocks at least two inches from the tires. Now you'll need to get up on the wing to service the wing tanks. Be careful to stay inside the designated areas when walking around on the wing. Stepping outside these areas could cause serious damage to the wing surface. Once you've positioned the fuel hose on the wing, ground it to one of the identified grounds. Next, grab your screwdriver and remove the fuel tank filler cap. Service the tank to the desired level. Be careful not to overfill it. Once the tank is serviced, replace the fuel tank filler cap. 
The fuel truck will probably need to be moved several times to service all the tanks. This involves reeling in the hose and disconnecting the ground wires. When you've serviced all the tanks and reeled in the hose, remove the ground wires for the fuel truck. Disconnect from the truck to the aircraft first and from the earth ground second. Reposition the chocks. Annotate the aircraft forms to indicate the refueling. That's all there is to refueling the aircraft. Now it's time to check under the hood, so to speak. The next task we'll review is engine oil and constant speed drive servicing. You'll need a stand, a can opener or oil spout, a rag to clean up any spilled oil, and the proper oil. Use MIL-L-7808 or the NATO equivalent O-148. First, ensure the aircraft is grounded before beginning. If the engines have been shut down for more than one hour, they must be motored for two minutes prior to servicing the oil. Position the stand and engage the wheel locks. Open the oil tank access door by disengaging the two thumb latches. Remove the cap from the oil filler neck. If less than one hour has elapsed since engine shutdown, the oil level should be at the lower edge of the filler neck. If more than one hour has elapsed, the engines should have been motored for two minutes and the oil should be up to the bottom of the tank screen. Use only a can opener or an oil spout to open the oil. Using a screwdriver could contaminate the oil with shavings and destroy an engine. Once the oil is serviced to the proper level, wipe up any spills. Replace the oil cap and close the access door. While you're checking the oil on engines 1, 3, 5, and 7, it's a good idea to check the constant speed drive oil tank. First, make sure that external air is not applied to the aircraft while you're doing this task. A hazardous situation could result if it is. Remove the access panel located aft and below the engine oil access door. Wipe off the oil tank scupper before you remove the oil tank cap. Remove the oil tank cap and visually check the oil level. If less than one hour has elapsed since engine shutdown, the oil should be spillover full. If not, some will need to be added. Service the system with MIL-L-7808 or NATO equivalent O-148. When you're finished, replace the oil cap and panel. Be sure to clean up any oil spilled on the cowling. Once you've serviced all the engines, remove the stand from the area. Next, we'll look at hydraulic servicing. We'll cover the body system and inboard and outboard wing systems. We won't look at servicing the rudder elevator system as it requires special tools and training to accomplish the task. This job requires two people. You need a power cart, a B4 stand, a Phillips screwdriver, and the correct hydraulic fluid. Use MIL-H-5606 or the NATO equivalent, H-515. Ensure the aircraft is grounded before you start. Position the power cart and apply external power to the aircraft. Now you must depressurize the hydraulic system. To depressurize the body system, remove the left forward bypass key. Position the left body system standby pump switch to standby. The pressure indicator should read 3,000 PSI, plus or minus 250 pounds. Operate the brake pedals and have your assistant inform you when the accumulators are bled down. Ensure there is no further decrease of the accumulator pressure gauge for the right forward, left aft, and right aft accumulators. Place the left body standby pump switch to off. Operate the brake pedals again until the left forward accumulator is bled down. Then reinstall the bypass key. You can depressurize the inboard and outboard wing systems by operating the control wheel until no movement occurs in the outboard. 
Turn interphone power off. Disconnect external power. All systems are now depressurized and sight gauge readings will be accurate. Any indications that are between the refill and full mark show that no servicing is required for that system. If servicing is required, you must bleed off the 16-stage air pressure using the air service valve before removing the reservoir cap. Depress the valve until airflow stops. To service the reservoir, you must open an access panel on top of the wing and remove the reservoir cap. Remember, use only a can opener or an oil spout when you open the can. Using a screwdriver could lead to contamination of the hydraulic system. Add the specified fluid until the sight gauge reading is between the refill and full mark. Replace the filler cap and secure the access panel. We've looked at the must-do items. Now let's review some special tasks that might need to be done in certain cases, starting with starter cartridge installation. You'll have to load them if you've landed at an airfield where an air cart is not available. A stand or ladder and a large flathead screwdriver are required. Your flight manual contains an installation checklist. We'll cover the procedure using tally cartridges. Before you start, ensure the engine ignition circuit breakers are pulled and the starter switches are off and flight pneumatic. Start by opening the cartridge access door on the engine nacelle. Remove the breech cap by pulling the disconnect handle and rotating the breech cap counterclockwise until it comes free. Clean the inside of the breech cap with a dry rag. Remove the cartridge from its container using only the key opener provided on the container. Do not use a can opener as it could puncture the cartridge. Now would be a good time to ground yourself, using your bare hands, of course. Bend the grounding clip away from the electrical contact to release the contact and serve as a ground between the cartridge and the breech. Place the breech cap over the cartridge. Position the breech cap in the breech chamber and engage the locking lugs. Pull the disconnect handle and rotate the cap clockwise. Finally, close the starter cartridge access door. Our next task is a relatively easy one, filling the EDS window wash tank. Only distilled or demineralized water may be used to do this. Tap water may be used only in emergencies. Ensure the aircraft is grounded through the forward and aft wheel wells and to one or two identified ramp grounds. Ground the water truck by connecting it to the same earth ground as the aircraft and to the plug in the forward wheel well. Open the access panel on the right side of the FLIR turret. Remove the cap slowly. Minimize the flow rate of the water before you insert the nozzle into the port. Failure to do this could result in damage to the water tank. Fill the tank to the bottom of the filler neck. Reinstall the filler cap and close the panel. Remove the ground wire from the truck to the aircraft, then from the truck to the earth ground. If you deployed the drag chute upon landing, you will need to close the door before takeoff. The strange field checklist in your flight manual calls for the crew to reload a new chute. However, this would not be practical without special training and a drag chute stand. The latter item might be hard to find in a strange field environment, so you'd have to improvise. A B5 stand is the shortest stand that can be used. Use two of them if possible. Open the drag chute deployment mechanism access door on the left side of the aircraft. In the cockpit, move the drag chute control lever to deploy, jettison, and locked. Ensure the pointer inside the compartment agrees with the cockpit indication. Close the drag chute deployment mechanism access door. Open the jettison jaws access door located forward of the drag chute door. 
close the jettison jaws by pulling up sharply on the strap. Open the left and right cable access doors. Pull up on both door cables simultaneously. Place the cable terminals in the door studs. Next, locate the hand crank and adapter. Normally, it's stowed inside the pneumatic access door. On many aircraft, you will find it inside the crew entry hatch. Install the adapter in the splined hole on the left side of the fuselage and install the hand crank into the adapter. Engage the pawl on the ratchet gear by pulling the ratchet lever outboard and rotating it. Rotate the hand crank counterclockwise until the door is fully closed and latched. Listen for two clicks from the door latches. To free the ratchet, rotate the hand crank slightly counterclockwise. Pull the ratchet lever outboard and rotate it to disengage the pawl from the gear. Relieve the tension on the door cables by rotating the hand crank about one half turn clockwise. The door should remain closed and latched. In the cockpit, attempt to move the drag chute control lever to jettison. It should not move. Close the jettison jaws access door. Remove the door cables from the cable attached studs on the door. Close the cable access doors. Finally, remove the hand crank from the adapter and the adapter from the splined hole. Stow the hand crank on the pneumatic access door and the adapter inside the pneumatic system compartment. Ensure all the doors are closed and securely fastened. This concludes our review of B-52H servicing. We've covered the tasks that must be done and some that might to get your buff airborne again. It pays to be prepared. You owe it to yourself and your crew to know the proper procedures.